Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. The life and not so much Israel, but believers in God. And may we be those believers in God that are going to come to life. That we are going to come to life on behalf of God. And one thing that's so cool, just to get a precedent, a backbone of what's going on, and because people ask a lot, why did God allow Adolf Hitler to come to power in 1936? Why did God allow all these Jews to be killed and cooked in ovens and all this other stuff that happened to him. You know, why did God allow that? Church, God needed to wake up his chosen people. Why did he need to wake them up? Because they were in captivity for 2,800 years because of willful sin and disobedience, starting with the prophet Isaiah, right through all the Ezekiel, which we're going to talk about, right through the Malachi, the minor prophets, the Bible, uh, the New Testament, even when Jesus was on this earth, Israel was under the captivity of the Roman Empire, and they were under captivity until 1948, when they became a nation again, right after World War II ended in 1945, and since then, Jews have been flooding back to the Holy Land. In 1948, they had roughly 300,000 people. Today, they have just under 10 million people in a country the size of New Jersey. <laughs> the Jews that were scattered and as equal said they would scatter because of their sin and Daniel told them to run to the hills because that was their only safe place but they have turned away uh, from their sin. They have asked God to forgive them for the sins of their fathers and God has blessed the Holy Land with an amazing economy like you, they found oil in 2001 and since then the economy of Israel has been taking off. Praise the Lord. You say, why is that significant? Well, we're going to find out here tonight that Ezekiel prophesied, prophesied in the year 600 or so uh, B.C. that in the end times that the dry bones would come to life and it would be that generation that saw the dry bones, the rebirth of Israel would be the generation that saw the return of the Messiah. You say, Pastor, well, what if, isn't that when he first came? No, because when Jesus came, they were under the control of Rome. When Jesus returns, Israel is going to be their own nation. And we're going to find out tomorrow night to where Jesus speaks of the generation. The baby boom generation saw Israel become a nation again in May of 1948. Our president, Harry Truman, was influential in Israel becoming a nation again. And today, Israel is 66 years old. When you think about it, the same generation, the average lifespan in the America is 78 years old. That's our average lifespan. But the world citizen, when you put in Africa and South America and you put in Asia and you put in Mexico and all the countries of the world, the average age of a world citizen is 64 years old. I believe Jesus Christ is coming soon. I believe Jesus is going to return because Ezekiel said, when they, we're going to read it here in just a second, Ezekiel said the dry bones are going to come alive. In church, which is why I believe if we take the prophecy of Scripture and we put the pieces together, whether you're a young person 14 years old or whether you're an older person 80 years old, it doesn't matter that when you see the dry bones come alive and you see and understand what's taking place, I pray that your dry bones are going to come alive and say, I'm getting in the game. I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to declare the good news. I'm not just going to sit by and be mute. I'm going to get in the game because I don't want to be dry up like Israel was for 2,800 years. I want to be like Ezekiel was, a watchman on a wall with life and with excitement and declaring the good news for such a time as this. Think about that, church. Think about that. Think about a country that is dead and that was spiritually dead. Now, they never were conquered because God had promised Abraham that I would protect your nation. Why did God wipe them out? Because God promised Abraham 
It couldn't happen. Remember, this is after the flood, and God had to God had to raise up other nations, and God had to even allow Adolf Hitler to come to power before his people would finally see the light with World War II. But church, let me just say this. God's waking up not just the Jew, but he'll wake up the Gentile too if you want to respond to the gospel, if you want to respond to the word with a sense of urgency that Jesus Christ is, is coming back for his church. And, and, and as, as Chris just said, there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. Church, I don't want my loved ones going to hell, do you? I want to at least be able to say I told them about Jesus. I at least want to be able to say, hey, I invited them to come to the foot of the cross. And I at least want to be able to say I was living for Jesus so I wasn't a stumbling block to someone in my life. Church, this is important stuff. Young people, this is really important for you. I know we talked about it in chapel today, but I just pray, please pray for our young people that they will have courage and boldness because our young people, they have less responsibility. You say, why is that? Because they're not married with children. They have better health. That's obvious. Young people are, are much more healthier than, than adults and seniors for the most part. You know, they're adventurous. You know, they're, 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 they're risk takers. They're ready to get their feet wet. And I pray that our young people here at Praise, and I praise God that they're here tonight. You know, I pray that we'll see our young people's soul catch on fire for Jesus Christ and start telling people about the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know what I believe, church? God is going to anoint Hunter and Nathan and a voice to speak for God. I believe God is going to anoint Chloe and, and Felicity and Mariah and Madison and Tony and our young people to do great things for the glory of God. Do you believe that? I believe that, church. I believe that. And let me tell you, some of our young people, if the older folks and the adults, you know what, Every the, the folks sitting in the front of any great revival in, in world history were young people. And I'll tell you what, I'd love to see our young people step up. I was blessed today. I was blessed to see them singing and playing instruments. I was blessed, you know. Now, I had to share today because Brandon was out of town. But I tell you what, we've had some good messages from Brandon and Josh. And our young people are going to get a turn this year, two or three turns for that matter, to share and how God is speaking to their heart. You know what I pray? I pray revival starts with our youth. Amen. Amen. Wow. That would be pretty cool. You say, Pastor, I'm not going to come because it's going to be too loud. <laughs> Tell you what, wear earplugs. <laughs> Tell you what, our young people, church, you know, we always talk about they're our future. I think it's time to let them, let them out of the bag and let this thing roll. With them. Right. And they, they have a foundation. They love the Lord. They, they, we've been equipping them. We've been teaching them. Parents, you've been setting an example for them. It's showtime. It is show, why is it showtime? Because Jesus might come back. All right, these dry bones are coming alive, and, and I'm excited about it, church. I, I really am. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word here in Ezekiel chapter 37, and we're going to be reading tonight the first 14 verses, praise the Lord. The first 14 verses tonight from Ezekiel. If you cannot find Ezekiel, it's uh, back there behind Jeremiah and, Dan and, and Daniel in that area of the major prophets. You still can't find it. Just listen with your ears. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these dry bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put some news on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, 
to prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath, and breath came upon them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, O oh, our, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. And when I opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Church, we're going to look at this from Israel's perspective, and we're going to look at this from our perspective as Gentile believers here tonight in the 21st century in the River Valley of Maine. We're going to look at it tonight, church, and I pray that we're going to feel our, bro our bones just coming alive, the shell that's around us, the wall that's around us to start to come down and to start to shine for Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we, we get all tied up in life. Sometimes we don't feel like we can move spiritually. Well, God's ready to cut those chains around your arms and around your ankles. He's ready to take you out of a straight jacket and ready to set you free, ready for you to declare your faith and to understand the times just like Jacob's son, Ishakar, who understood the times. And I pray that we'll understand the times as well and our dry bones will come to life. And church, let me just say this, because maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, pastor, uh, well, we do all these different things. We're here every day but Monday. Church, that's wonderful. That's great. But what I'm more interested in is building the kingdom of heaven. I'm not satisfied until every soul comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. I'm not satisfied until we are soaking in the spirit of the almighty God and loving Jesus and his commandments, showing ourselves to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Can you honestly say, church, that there are no dry bones in the River Valley? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You don't believe me? Follow along with me. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dry bones. People can talk apart. But church, I want to see, as my mother would always say to me growing up, and you've heard the saying too, actions speak louder than words. And as the church comes alive, we're going to not just impact this community as being a body of believers that cares. We're going to impact this community because we're going to see lives changed and souls saved to the glory of God. Well, church, this is also prophecy of Israel. And as we break this down, it's important for us to understand what's taking place currently in the Holy Land. And what's currently taking place, which is why the adversary is heating things up which is why we are reading these articles about the Palestinian authority wanting to cross Gaza and go into Israel from the south. Why the Iranians under the dollar of the Russian coming into the Mediterranean Sea with ships and with, with missiles and other things aimed at Israel. Why Iran just last year, you know, with the, with the weapons that they built right in the border of Iraq can now reach Israel and Jerusalem from the western part of Iran for the first time in history. And what's their target? They want to hit the Holy Land. And you know what? If you go, let me just say this. If you go from the eastern part of Iran, guess how far their missiles can hit? Their missiles can hit Los Angeles, California, as it goes from Iran and heads east to California. Why do they want to hit us? Because we're the great Satan. Because we support Israel. 
Church, this is very important. This is very under, you know, these, the reason these things are heating up is not a coincidence. I believe the adversary is showing his ugly head because he knows his days are shortened. He, just like he did with Jesus on the earth after Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. What was the adversary? It was right there in Matthew chapter 4 as Jesus had been fasting. He was right there ready to tempt Jesus to try to keep him from getting out of the gate to do his father's will. And we know that the adversary was working all throughout Jesus' life. Why? Because he knew where Jesus was going to the cross. And even now, the adversary knows what's taking place. And as Christians, we can know too because we have the word. Amos 3 tells us that, that God will not uh, move and not bring judgment until he first reveals his prophecy to his, his secrets to his prophets. And you know tonight, if you open up God's word and you're and you're not afraid to open up a poet, a, a, a prophetic book like the Book of Ezekiel, you can have an inside scoop of what's going on all around you today. And you can sit back and say, "Wow, this is pretty amazing. I never knew that was in the Bible. I've had pastors tell me that. I never knew that was in the Bible. I never knew the. I never knew what Daniel had predicted. I never knew what Ezekiel had predicted or Isaiah had predicted." prophetically speaking. And the one thing, church, that's so cool about the prophets, and especially Ezekiel, they name names. They name the names that are, gonna, that are key players. You just don't have to pick them out of a hat. They name names. They, they list off the countries. Now, you may have to take Ezekiel's time and what that country's name was in Ezekiel's time of 600 B.C. But let me tell you, church, as you study history as I have, it will not take you long to find out, just like in America. It won't take you long to find out we used to be a British colony. It won't take you long to find out at all that Maine used to be part of Massachusetts until March 15, 1820. It's not going to take you long to find out, do a little research, and just put the pieces together that Persia's biblical name during that day is now modern Iran. It's not going to take you long to figure these things out, that Babylon is modern day Iraq. And church, all we have to do is take the pieces and add up, and then all we have to do after that is pull out our current events and say, oh my, this is getting very interesting. Church, Hollywood couldn't come up with what the Bible said. Hollywood couldn't come up with these pieces. Israel coming alive. Uh, you know, these dry bones, the people returning back uh, to Israel. And for 2,800 years, Israel's population declined every year as people were scattered throughout the world. Throughout the world. And many of them came to the United States. Where are they going now? They're going back to the Holy Land. They're going back in the midst of all that's going on with all the suicide bombing and everything that's going on. Jews are going back to the Holy Land. They're giving up their citizenship in America. Some of them are American citizens with Jewish heritage and they're going back to the Holy Land. Why is that? Because Ezekiel said it would. Why is the economy taking off? Why? This doesn't make any sense. Israel has the third fastest growing economy in the world today. Hallelujah. Amazing. And they were in ruins. They were in ruins 60 years ago. Think about it. Think about it. Those of you that know American history, after we had war, after we had the Civil War ended in 1865, it took America 40 years just to get out of the gates. Reconstruction is probably our worst time in history. In my opinion, worse than the Great Depression. We had many poor presidents. Uh, the, the slave issue, the church was divided. The Reconstruction era after Lincoln was assassinated from 1865 to Theodore Roosevelt 1901 was one of our driest times in history. And the economy certainly didn't get out of the gate. And what brought our economy out was World War I. <coughs> and certainly World War II. Israel. What's happening there is unprecedented as far as history goes. As well as economics. For those of you who have studied economics and supply and demand. It's, it's blowing people away. Why is that? Because Ezekiel, as we break down these verses tonight, Ezekiel is going to get real serious. And if you continue reading into Ezekiel, you will see where as the dry bones come alive, the next step is going to be an alliance called Magog under the leadership of a Russian czar called Gog that is going to come down along with their alliance of Persia, modern day Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, Syria, and Germany. Gomer is parts of Germany. Gomer is an area that was settled by by Noah's son and a piece of Germany. And by the way, I was doing some research and listening 
uh, to Joel Rosenberg. He was talking about to where the Nazi and the skinhead movement amongst the young people in Germany today is rising in great proportions to where you would think it was the 1930s again. And their target is Jewish people. Well, church, it's important to know that Ezekiel would get to the point that this alliance would come in Ezekiel 38, and it would come hoping to blow Israel off the map and wipe them out from the north, coming down from the Golan Heights region. And you can read current events today, and you can see why, why, is, why is Russia so concerned with the eastern Ukraine. I believe it's because they're aiming and targeting for Israel. Why is us, Russia unprecedented in history, unprecedented in history, church, that Russia and Persia, modern-day Iran, are now become like that. First time ever. They've been arch enemies for history. And I even had history books at my house that talked about how this prophecy would never happen because these two nations hate each other, despise each other. That would be like in a football illustration, you know, the Cleveland Browns hanging out with the Steelers. That's just not going to happen, right? Because they don't like each other. Well, here's the thing. Russia and Persia have never liked each other. They have wanted to destroy each other. But now, there goes some buddies. Unprecedented. War of Gog and Magog is what it's called. And God's going to save his people. But before we get to that, we have to understand that Israel has to come alive. If Israel was dead, if Israel was in bondage to all these other nations, starting with Assyria all the way to the European nations of the 1930s and early 40s during World War I, Satan's not going to do anything. Why are things heating up in great proportion? Because Israel's coming alive. It's kind of like the fighter in the boxing ring. When he's getting beaten up pretty bad the first couple of rounds. And then he just says, I have nothing to lose. I'm laying it all on the line and starts coming back. Kind of like if you've watched the Rocky movies and Sylvester Stallone, you know, starts coming back against the villain. Well, here's Israel. Israel's coming back because there's life now in them. Well, church, we're going to find that that light comes from the Holy Spirit. And that same light, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to have in you tonight. I believe that. To come alive. And to speak and to know and to understand what's happening. And the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us. The Bible gives us this information. The Bible tells us that all this is going to happen. And we're seeing it. And we have a front row seat. A front row seat, guys. To, to know and to see this happen. It would, be, it would be a great tragedy for us as praise and for the church and believers to close our eyes to the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. You say, Pastor, why do I need to know this? I don't live in Israel. You need to know this because this is a, a prophetic peace that has to happen before Jesus can return. I pray that this peace will cause you to be motivated to begin to soak in the Spirit and to pray and ask for God's anointing to go forth and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Wow. <clears throat> Some of you, I know, we all here, by a show of hands, how many of us have lost loved ones that don't know Jesus Christ? Everyone in here. Many of them live in your very own household. They live with you. They're under your roof. They live on the same street. People that you have a platform. You say, Pastor, well, that's the hardest people to witness to. You know, that's not going to work with Jesus. Jesus is saying, no, I want to equip you and I want to motivate you. And if that means understanding that the dry bones come alive and that the current events of today are prophetic, meaning they're foreshadowing and they're setting the precedent, just like John the Baptist was the voice in the wilderness declaring that the Messiah was about to come, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. I'm his foreshadow. Guess what? We should be the foreshadow of Jesus' second coming because we know and understand the times. That's right. And out declaring the good news. People say, well, is Jesus going to have a foreshadower this time? No. It's going to be us. And the events that go, the, the events that take place to wake us up, to, to bring life to us as a dry bone. There's not going to be a prophet like John the Baptist. The, the, the prophet's going to be us, declaring the good news. And to be the forerunner. The only forerunner Jesus is going to have is the archangel when he blows the trump, raptures the church. And then you're going to see, the Bible says, you say, Pastor, well, I just watched that clip on Left Behind, and, 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 and that's going to wake everybody up when they see babies disappear and planes go down. Oh, no, it's going to produce hardness in their heart, the Bible says, just like with Pharaoh and the Egypt and the Exodus story. Hardness of heart. And, and Peter writes, you know, that any believer, you know, that has, has returned uh, or gone against God is going to be like the dog who returns to their vomit, and they're going to have nothing to do with the Lord. 
So any believer that says, well, I want to stay out, catch the second ship, oh no, your heart's going to become hard. The Bible says that in that tribulation will be folks that have heard the good news, that have never heard the good news. Are going to that are going to uh, come to know Christ. 144,000 Jews and a, an unknown select number of Gentiles. Church, you've got to be ready today, and may your dry bones come to life. But let's quickly break down these verses tonight, and then we need to pray. We need to pray that God is going to use us mightily. I pray that this stuff is interesting to you. I pray that you're getting to the edge of your seat. People you'll say, well, prophecy's boring. And I think they don't know their Bible. Right. Prophecy's far from boring. You understand the elements and pieces, and it's very simple to understand. When people say, oh, the prophetic books are so hard to understand, they give themselves away of never reading the context. They give themselves away. They have no idea what they're talking about. The prophetic books line up consistently, and it's very basic, I believe. Yes, you may have to look up some terms or some countries, but church, uh, uh, just as Jesus was, uh, the, as the prophets were leading up to his first coming, his second advent is just as prophetically significant and to understand those terms. Verse 1, Ezekiel declares, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. People say there's no Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. That's another uh, lie. They don't know what they're talking about. The Spirit of God, you know, the, the, the Moses there, when, when he created, when God created, uh, you know, he says, let us make man in our image, the, the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was upon many of the prophets. The Holy Spirit was various places. And so here's another piece where, the, where, where Ezekiel tells us, uh, brought me out, brought him out in the spirit of the Lord, and set him in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. You know, church, we live in the river valley, and it's a lot of dead bones out here. And I'm not talking about it in the cemetery. I'm talking about people breathing every day, and they're spiritually dead. And Jesus is saying to us, I want us, and I want you and me to start sharing our faith and breathing life into them here. But here's Ezekiel. He's walking around in the midst of a valley and full of bones. Then God calls me, the he there is capitalized, if you have a capitalized version of the Bible referring to the Lord. Then he calls me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And so here, God is causing Ezekiel to take a look at the valley and to look at the dry bone and to see how dry they are. When was the last time you really looked into the river valley to see what was going on here? When was the last time you really understood the history of the Israel and how dry they were for 2,800 years and why the land was scattered? People say, why didn't they just come in and just wipe out Israel? Why wasn't Jerusalem so significant during that time? Why didn't someone just take them out? Because God promised Abraham he would protect them. The Bible says even, you know, right before uh, Babylon was about to seize and take control of of, of um I'm sorry, right as, yeah, right as Babylon was about to seize and take control, you know, here comes Persia and the Medes coming in. And if you know the story of, 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 of Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar, next thing you know, here comes King Darius in of Persia to take control right as it looked like Jerusalem was going down permanently. And the same thing with the Persians. The next thing you know, God brings in Alexander the Great and the Greeks to come get Persia. Same thing with the Romans. And, and it's right on down through history. God would save his people by raising up another enemy. You know, but those bones were dry, but they're alive today. But have you looked around to see how much dryness we have in the River Valley today? How much dry bones we have, even, even within the church. The church and there many pastors dry. Dry, you know, just dry and, and, and tired and, and fatigued and, and some of the, the world has even come into their lives and into their home life and to their home front. But here, God's causing Ezekiel to walk around and see how very dry they are. Verse 3, and God said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And here God's asking his servant, the prophet Ezekiel, can they come alive? You know, church, ask yourself the question, do you believe God can reach every dry bone out in this area? Do you believe he can reach it? Do you believe he can reach, you know, into the bars and into the prostitution houses, into, you know, the things that are going on tonight 
And, and every Friday night, usually some horrific things happen, and I get a call Saturday morning by sometimes many people that, are, that come here on Sunday. But, you know, dryness, dryness, dryness. Well, here is God. He is speaking, and he asks Ezekiel a question. Can these bones live? Ezekiel says, so I answered, oh, Lord, you know. You know what? Interesting. You really have to continue reading to see what was in Ezekiel's heart. But some of us can quickly give an answer. Oh, yeah, Lord, they can live. But church, one thing just to be convinced, or to believe, so that's another thing to be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, or the word that Paul used in the, God, in the epistles were, were persuaded. Here, we're going to find is that Ezekiel knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God could bring life to any dry bone, whether it was Israel or any person. Verse number five, thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. We need to begin to pray that God, just like he's bringing breath into the nation of Israel, <coughs> that God will bring breath into the red, white, and blue. God will bring breath into the River Valley citizen. God will bring breath into the church and wake us up before it's too late. And to be found soaking in his spirit. You say, Pastor, are, are we in a revival? Again, it's not all about the action. Church, it's about the heart. It's about the heart changing. If you guys had any idea, any idea at all of what's going on in people's lives. And there is the Lord saying, hey, I want to bring life. I want to bring life. I want to bring change. But when we get to the part where Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Bible class, you know this, cut off the hand, causing you to sin, pluck out the eye, causing you to sin. We can't get to that point. Until we get to that point, then revival will come. Because the heart's going to change. People will say, enough of the drugs, enough of the sex, enough of the alcohol. Enough of I'm ready to change. I'm ready not to go back to that place. People say to me all the time, Pastor, how, where is God? You know, when I need him, he's saying, hey, you've got to cut out that eye that's causing you to sin. You've got to get rid of that thing. You've got to get rid of that crutch. God's waiting on you to say, enough. That's got to go. Amen. Amen. Wow. Think about that, church. Just this year and the last year, you know, folks robbing from the benevolence can. Folks misleading people and, and, and taking advantage of, of all the different things we've had to deal with. You can come to the altar all day long, but until you let God's word penetrate your soul, your dry bones are not coming to life. That's right. God wants to bring life through what? Through his word. Amen. Ezekiel was going to bring his word. Now, Ezekiel wouldn't see these dry bones come to life. Ezekiel wouldn't. Jeremiah didn't. Daniel didn't. Micah didn't, Malachi, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Amos, all the minor prophets. They didn't see it. Jesus, when he was on this earth, when he died, when he was risen, when he lived on the earth 40 days and ascended, Rome was still in control. Israel was still dry. Who's going to see it for such a time as this? We are seeing it, church. And all you got to do is read your current events. The nation of Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel's having elections. The borders of Israel. The capital of Israel, which is Tel Aviv. The holy city is still Jerusalem. But Israel is a nation. We're seeing it firsthand. And if God can do it for Israel, God can do it for us in the river valley. I believe that. I believe that. And that may mean you have to do some prayer and anointing and really get serious with people. And, and really pray them through and challenge them to pluck out the eye. Just don't, ex just don't say, oh, they just gave up and they didn't do all this. And just go after them. Be part of their life and build in them. And I never give up on someone. Why? Because God never gives up. Amen. Not until Jesus Amen. Christ returns and the tribulation comes. But even then, people will get saved because of the mercy of God during that period of time. But church, here is, here is, here is God speaking. Verse number 6. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. This is God bringing life. I will, put, I will bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Here is God saying to that bone, I'm going to put covering. I'm going to put flesh to that bone. I'm going to bring a soul. I'm going to bring life. And that's what he did with Israel, with letting Hitler come to power. He woke up that nation, and, and, and that nation has been living a life 
Uh, they, they still have battles and suicide bombs every day, but they're a nation today. They are reborn today. They are 66 years old this year. Praise the Lord. There is life that's taking place, and they have a prime minister who just came out and said, right on our soil in the United Nations in New York, and said, hey, if we go down, if we go down, we may go down alone, but we're going to go down fighting, protecting our land. Wow. Dry bones coming alive. Could you imagine if dry bones in the river valley start coming alive? The people are going to fill these seats. They're going to fill these seats. Young people, uh, adults, seniors going to fill these seats. And I believe it's going to come through the preaching of God's word and through the prayer and action of God's people. Amen. Amen. All of us in here tonight. All ages. I want to see, as I said, I want to see our young people in the front lines. I want to see our adults in the front lines. And I want to see the seniors. Praise the Lord for seniors. And I'm not talking about seniors in high school. I'm talking about senior citizens, praise the Lord, that are out here declaring the good news, you know, and standing on the word of God, praise the Lord. Seniors, don't stay home. I praise God that Roger's out tonight and Mary's out tonight. I praise the Lord they're out here tonight. You know, ready to get more of God's word and to be in the front lines with the Lord. And so, church, here we, as we continue on, verse 7. So I prophesied, which is referring to declaring truth of God's word or declaring a future event. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Remember, Ezekiel was commanded by God to prophesy and speak to the dry bones earlier in the verses we read. He was also commanded back in Ezekiel 3, as we read last night, to be a watchman on the wall. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. What's Ezekiel saying here is that God began to bring life. Church, it's not us that can do anything. It is God that brings life to these dry bones. It is God that is bringing Israel together again. It is God that is putting the current events on that paper. Why? To get us ready for his return. Tomorrow night as we look at the events as Jesus explained them, you're going to sit back and say, uh-oh, I need to make sure I have my house in order because Jesus Christ is coming back, praise the Lord. And, and, and it's going to be unprecedented things. But God's going to do the work. Amen. It is God that does the work. And I'm talking about real, I'm talking about the heart changing stuff. Sure, we can have a party, we can show a movie, but it is God that changes the heart for real. That's right. It is God that, that penetrates the soul. It is the Father who reveals the Son, Jesus Christ, to this lost and dying world. And here it is God that Ezekiel is saying as he looked at these dry bones that he saw it come into life. God was moving in them. God was bringing life. But he says here, but there was no breath in them. And this is the tough part, you because as Christians, we want things done immediately. As God starts to bring life, and we've had amazing services here at Praise, wonderful services. And we start to see a little life, but then we say, oh, that was great. And then we're satisfied till the next Christmas. Man, sometimes I sit and wonder where God will move like he did a couple weeks ago here. And just to worship and to praise God and to step in that pulpit. Those are some of the greatest uh, or the easiest sermons to preach after you've been in the presence of the Lord. And I'm thinking, wow, Lord, we had 96 people here this morning. Where people are going to tell their friends they're going to come back into your house that night and they're going to want more of that. And instead, attendance is... And God moved. God saved a soul. God, 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 God brought life. Church, revival is going to take place when we come alive and we begin to breathe. Wow. When we begin to say, wow, Jesus is there and he's going to breathe in me. That's what Ezekiel was saying is about to happen with Israel. They're going to start moving. Say, Pastor, when was that for Israel? That was during World War II. Well, once the truth began to happen of what was really taking place, you, you know, in the 30s, they were selling, Hitler was, was, of course, this was before Internet and all that, but Hitler had people convinced that they were going on a vacation. When they picked up these Jews, they put them on trains thinking they were going on a free vacation to start over. They had no idea they were going to concentration camps in Poland to be cooked. 
They had no idea. They were, they were buying into this jargon that he was using. As he, and by the time we found out, it was 1942. Pearl Harbor had just happened in 1941. It was Japan that brought us into the war, not Germany. Those of you that know American history, we didn't have an understanding. I mean, it was amazing. But what God was doing is he was bringing, he was bringing uh, them to life. He was putting flesh on their bones, but there was not breath. There was not breath. There was not breath until 1948. And Israel breathed their first breath. I can't wait, church, when Mary and I's first child is born and we get to hear them breathe. Right now, God's working on that little body that's about an inch and a half. Little body, little legs, we're told, are kicking. And God's just forming that body. The bones are coming to life. The flesh is being formed on them bones. Praise the Lord. I'm excited, but I can't wait to hear the baby breathe. Because then there's life. I can't wait to that. And I'm going to say, you've got to be an Orioles fan. <laughs> It'll be baseball season in May. But church, think about that. It's so different. Right now, that baby's got flesh. That baby, that baby, the bones are moving. And we get an email every day of what's happening every day along the way. All right? And, but when that baby comes out of the womb and the doctor has to smack it on the bottom or whatever they do to make it cry, that's going to be pretty cool as that baby breathes on its own. Praise the Lord. And I'm excited for that. I really am. You're saying you won't be in about six weeks later when you're tired of crying. <laughs> but I'm excited to hear that baby breathe. Here, church, it's so cool. It's so cool that there's no breath, but there's about to be. Verse number, uh, verse number nine. And God said to him, prophesy and to breathe. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. God commanded his servant Ezekiel to bring and to pray and to speak and to prophesy breath. Church, we need to start doing that and to command <laughs> breath to come out of the dry bones of the river valley. And you know what began to happen during World War II? And they began to command breath, including our president uh, after World War II. And Harry Truman, uh, obviously Franklin Roosevelt had died in office. Vice President Truman became president, you know, in April of, 19, of 1945. And when, he, and when he became president, he began to be part of that breathing life into a nation once again. And we can do the same just as Ezekiel had prophesied before. And how do you say you do? We, there's power in the tongue, church. Do you know you have power to bring life to someone or to bring death to them? Amen. I pray that you guys will build people up, not tear them down. Build them up through a word of exhortation. Build them up through encouraging or bring life to them. Bring hope to them that they are something special. They're, and that's why I want to, every time I'm working with young people, I want to bring life to them. I want them to, hey, they, they have a spot here. They have a spot, and they have, a, they have an important piece. That you know, how, you know how the old saying, children are meant to be seen and not heard. And all that, all church. I don't think, I think our, Jesus said, let the children come. Our young people need to be heard shining for Jesus, which is why I'm blessed to see them up here. I was blessed to see Felicity sitting there playing the playing that thing. Praise the Lord. You know, I was blessed to see, you know, God moving. I'm blessed to see, you know, all the ages out here shining for Jesus Christ. And you know what, church? That's what Ezekiel did when he commanded life. He commanded breath into the dry bones. And we need to do the same. Say, Pastor, you feel like there's a sense of urgency? Yes, there is. Because Jesus is coming. We just sang the king is coming. I didn't just sing that because it was a good song to sing. And Mary didn't play because it was a good song. I, we believe it. Amen. We play that song a lot, by the way, at home. She'll play that. She'll sing the verses to it. And, what, and the king is coming. The king is coming, church. And as, and as, and as Ezekiel continues, verse number, uh, the end of verse number 9, he says, that they may live. Those dry bones may live and stay living, not die again. 
Ezekiel's not going to die again. No nation is going to seize Israel ever again. God is going to protect them, the Bible says. Right. They don't have to worry about Iran. Right. God's going to protect them. They don't have to worry about Egypt. God's going to protect them. They don't have to worry about the Palestinian Authority. God's going to protect them. They don't have to worry about Iraq coming here. God's going to protect them. They don't have to worry about Russia. God's going to protect right. them. They're going to live and not die. This idea that Christians coming to Christ and having life for a day and then going back to, to the old self and dying, that is not biblical. Jesus said, I come to give life and life more abundantly. Wow. To breathe in them, breathe life. People say, Pastor, how do I really know I'm saved? I'll tell you what, if you really saved, you're going to know it. You're going to have life. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be peaches and cream. But you're, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have life for the Lord. And here, uh, Ezekiel is bringing life, and he's prophesying. Verse number 10, so I prophesied as he commanded, which meant Ezekiel was obedient. Are you ready to be obedient tonight? Are you ready to be obedient for the Lord? Are you ready to speak for him? Are you ready to get down and dirty? Are you ready to understand the times? And you know what? You guys are saying, yes, I am, because you just can't be cool and come up with all these current events that you've either set or printed. You did some research, not just because you wanted to impress the pastor. You really wanted to take a look to see what is going on in this world and what does the Bible say about this stuff? And after tomorrow night, you're going to be able to find a lot of them. Our, our kids are going to be real busy in Bible class on Tuesday. <coughs> Praise the Lord. They're going to be real busy. Gluing and sticking and all that stuff. We'll probably try to glue them to each other. I'll be ready to referee should that happen. White detention slips are in my desk. I'm just God. But he says there, verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breathe came, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, and an exceedingly great army. Think about that, church. If the dry bones in the river valley stand upon their feet, we're going to be like Israel, even to the point that they stand alone. You know what, church? If we're the only body of believers in the river valley that's going to stand and preach the word and live Jesus Christ, so be it. I'd rather be us than sit back and we're just going to join the crowd. I don't want there to be a dead church. You want to be a dead church? No. Breaks my heart the amount of churches that are going now to meet uh, in the pastor's home because they don't have money to put in the tank, you know, to keep the lights on during the winter months. Breaks my heart. I pray. I pray, church, in the midst of all the, of the bad economy and all this stuff that's doom and gloom, here we may we be found growing and God moving, lives being changed, souls being saved, and then by this building, praise the Lord, and, you know, be able to say to God be the glory. The dry bones have come alive, and they are going to stand as a mighty army. Praise the Lord. Onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war. Wow. Right here for such a time as this. Such a time as this in Ezekiel, he, he saw that, a great army, and he saw, and he saw Israel come into life. Verse 11, then he, God said to, to Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. So right here, the, the specific context is Ezekiel saw Israel coming alive. He saw the entire house of Israel, which if you know the history of Israel, you know that's threefold. That's the church, the priests, and the elders, and the leaders. That's the government, and that's the people, the entire house of Israel coming together and coming to life. Praise the Lord. And you know what, church? That's what's happening in the Holy Land today. Many Jews coming to know Christ. Messianic Jews coming to know Christ. Churches in the churches there in the Holy Land. People sharing the gospel. And here Ezekiel prophesied that would happen. You say, Pastor, why is that significant? Because it didn't happen for 2,800 years. Think about that. It happened one time. And that's in the last 66 years. One time in 2,800 years. You don't believe me? Bring out any history book on Israel. Bring out any world history. Find, check it out for yourself. And you'll quickly find. That it's only the last 66 years since World War II that this dry bone was coming to life. They indeed shall say our bones are dry, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves. 
and cause you to come up from the graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Praise be to God. You know what? When God woke the people up after World War II, the Jews began to flock Israel like never before. They come up out of their spiritual dryness and they began to return to the Holy Land, which is why they went from 300,000 people to today they have just under 10 million. And by 2020, they're expected to have 12 million or more people in the Holy Land. Amen. You say, why is that happening? Because they're reproducing there, praise the Lord. Children are being born, first generation Jews once again in the Holy Land. God is moving like you would not believe. And it's amazing, church, what's taking place there. They're coming out of their grave, spiritually speaking. He's not talking about Abraham coming up out of his grave. He's talking about the Jewish lineage, the Jewish heritage, coming up and living for God and returning home for the first time in 2,800 years. Could you imagine if God did that in the River Valley? He filled these chairs. We'd have to preach a couple sermons. Wouldn't that be something? That'd be a great problem to have, Chris, wouldn't it? Pastor, we're at fire code. We've got a whole tell them to come back to service too. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have? Or, or to say, you know what, ministry team, we've got to put up some TVs upstairs and put people up there, and they'll just have to watch and listen from up there. Right, right. That'd be pretty cool. I'd have to tell the ministry team, hey, I, my voice is shot, Andy. You've got to preach sermon too. That'll fill the place real quick just to hear what he's got to say. That's about what he'd say. Amen, you're dismissed. So he'd do a great job. He'd do a great job. I know it wholeheartedly he'd do a wonderful job. God spoke to his heart and moved. I have full confidence in all the ministry team to be ready in and out of season to bring the word. Because God's going to move like that, church. God is going to move, and it's going to be exciting. Praise the Lord. Why? Because the dead are going to come alive, spiritually speaking. Verse number 13, we're almost done. And we're a little, a little later, but it's a Friday night. It's not a school night. I pray no one has a roast cooking. <laughs> but here, here it is, church. Here it is. Verse 13, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. Why does God want to bring life to Israel? Why does God want to bring life to us in the river valley and to us sitting here tonight? For one reason, to bring himself glory, honor, and praise. Not to say we got the best church in town. Well, that's why a lot of revivals get started great, but then they fizzle out because they start making it about themselves. Church, Jesus Christ is the commander-in-chief, not just the Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, we're the church. He's the head. We're just the arms and the legs. We're, he's the he's the command. He's the one speaking and moving forward. And the moment anything becomes about us rather than God, then you, you know what? You put yourself back in the coffin. <laughs> the breath is going to just leave from you. Which is why in the last days, even the elite are going to fall away. I don't want that, dude. I want to have life and, and want to be able to give God the glory for everything that he's doing. Everything he's doing with our young people, with our adults, and with our seniors, with everything that God, even our children. even Doesn't it bless you? Kid time. You know, the, you sing a song, God's Not Dead, and they know it. And they're singing it. That was pretty cool. That was spontaneous. That, that was because that little David, he had been hung in, he had been taught the ways of God, and he knew that song and was ready to shine. And our kids are even, our kids are even being used of God, to God be the glory. But it's so important that you get this, that we understand why God's going to move is because he wants us to know that he's the Lord and that he is alive and well. And as we already know, God's not dead. He's surely alive, living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead. And the Bible says that God, Jesus Christ, is the lion of Judah. Wow. That's our verse, by the way, for our school. Courageousness of a lion. Lastly, verse 14 tonight. I will put my spirit in you. Wow. Think about that. What's going to make sure that the dry bones stay alive? It's the spirit of God. We just came off of who is the Holy Spirit, a four-part series. This should all be making sense to us as believers if you've been listening the last two weeks. The Spirit of God, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. 
And here God tells Ezekiel in verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Which means you're not going back to those dry bones anymore. So something's not right when we see a believer live today and go back to the dry bones. Something's missing. God wants to put the spirit inside you. He wants to bring life to you and bring life. And that's the message that we have to take. Whether it's to a Muslim, whether it's to a Jew, whether it's to a Christian, whether it's to an atheist, whether it's to a fallen away believer, whoever it might be. We've got to bring hope and life that comes to the glorification of Jesus Christ the Son. And that they may live and not die. And this is why I know no nation will ever have control over Israel again. Amen. No nation. And the Antichrist is going to try. But as soon as he declares himself to be the Messiah, at the three and a half point, the prophet Daniel tells us in the 70 weeks prophecy, and the, and the prophet John, or the John, uh, the revelator in Revelation tells us, as soon as that happens, there's going to be a great earthquake, and the, and the Antichrist is in trouble from that point. He knows his days are numbered. Wow. Awesome stuff. This stuff, man, this just puts chills up my spine just thinking about it. No nation is ever going to stand and declare themselves to be the controller of Israel again. And you know what? There ain't no devil in hell or any of his minions ever going to say they have control of Justin Thacker again. I'm not going back to pre June 15, 1997 in my life. Jesus came into my heart that day and he's staying in there. Amen. And Paul said, you've got to work out your salvation and die daily. That's what I plan to do. The fact that Jesus died for me, I'm going to live for him. I'm going to bring glory and honor and praise to him every day of my life. Why? Because I want the spirit of God inside of me. So that I live. Do you want to go back to who you were before you came to know Christ? Think about it. Think about who you were before. My goodness. I hope nobody does. In the last part, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Who's doing the work is equal. No. God's doing the work through his equal. God's doing the work of changing the heart. God's doing the work of bringing life to dry bones. Who's doing the work here at Praise? God's doing the work. God's doing the work when he has given us favorable reputation with the town of Rumford, with the police department, with the Oxford County Sheriff's Office. God's doing the work when he lays on the heart of the right aid to come here and say, hey, can we, uh, can we uh, use your facility? We want you to help us do, you know, a wellness clinic for a flu vaccine. God's the one laying on the heart of the AmeriCorps group. Hey, can we come in November because we see that there's something different about you guys. God's laying on the heart to bring people here from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I believe, church, God is moving because he's alive. And I believe God can know that he can lay his head right here. Do you know in Isaiah, God says, where can I lay my head? Where can I put my feet? He's talking about his own house. Many places God's not welcome in his own house. Are you welcome in your own house? Amen. Could you imagine if, if you weren't welcome in your own house? That's got to be painful. God's not welcome in many of his houses. The cross is offensive. Can't sing about the blood. Prayer is out the door. Christian education, reading, uh, reading the Bible or Sunday school, whatever you want to call it, no longer important. God's not welcome. We can only preach. I know in my home church, it's sad to say this, you know, but many times, you know, it, it's a 10-minute message because I know you're busy, so I'm just going to let you go. Or we see this happening in Maine big time. You know what? It's summertime in Maine, and it only gets to about 80 degrees, but it's hot in here, so we're going to go ahead and dismiss you because it's hot, and so let's just close the service down. You know, is God really welcome in that place? Church, think about this. I believe God is, knows that he's welcome here. Read Isaiah 66. I believe God knows he's welcome here and can, he can lay his feet here and he can lay his head here and he's going to move here and he's going to bring life to dry bones. The question is, are you going to go tell people he's going to? This doesn't happen if Ezekiel doesn't proclaim it. 
Israel doesn't come alive if Ezekiel didn't proclaim this word. Say, Pastor, how do we know Ezekiel proclaimed the word? We just read about it tonight. This doesn't happen. Unless Ezekiel was obedient to the voice of God and prophesied as he said, I am commanded to do. Guess what? We're commanded to as well. Lastly, let me close with this. The Great Commission. What was the last thing Jesus said before he ascended? Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he said, lo, I am with you always. Wow. We have a commandment too. And we have a commandment. To breathe life and proclaim truth to the dry bones. And just as we see Israel coming alive, we can see the river valley come alive too. All we have to do is open our eyes, proclaim the truth, and watch God do the rest. That's going to, that for his own glory, his own honor, and his own praise. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.